So today's webinar uh, has as topic ethical dilemmas in anthropological research, which is of course a very vast wide theme. We will have as participants colleagues from different countries. Uh, from Australia, Rosita Henry from James Cook University. She's also a fellow of the Australian Anthropological Society and the chair of the Ethics Task Force of WCA. From the Netherlands, Nico Besnier, Professor of Cultural Anthropology at the University of Amsterdam. And from August 2019 to August 2020, a fellow at the Helsinki Collegi Collegium for Advanced Studies. From Ireland, Thomas Strong, who is the chair of the Anthropological Association of Ireland and also a lecturer in the Department of Anthropology at Maynooth University. From Brazil, Luiz Duarte, from the, from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, also a former director of the Museu Nacional and also a professor at the Museu Nacional. He's also a former vice president of the Brazilian Anthropological Association. And finally, last but not least, from Mexico, Patricia Torres Mejia from the Centro de Investigaciones de Estudios Superiores en Antropología Social, and also a member of the Ethics Commission, Committee, or Commission, sorry, of the Mexican Association of Ethnologists and Social Anthropologists. So once again, thank you very much. And please, Posita, you have the word. Um, it's 11 p.m. here, and I'm, or just after, and I'm speaking from the city of Cairns, North Queensland, Australia. And as such, I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging uh, the First Nation peoples who are the original inhabitants and custodians of the land where I live and work. Uh, the majority of member associations of Waka have professional codes of, of eth um, ethics or guidelines or are in the process of developing them. But how many of us are actually very familiar with these codes? I suspect many of us only refer to such codes when we come face to face with some kind of crisis or when we are required to prepare re research proposals for institutional ethics review committees. Some anthropologists perceive ethics codes as causing more problems than they solve and many see ethics review committees as in fact creating ethical dilemmas for anthropologists, especially in relation to the principle of informed consent. In Australia, research is expected to be approved by ethics review committees in accordance with the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research. Ethical research, according to this statement, is founded on core principles of um, research merit and integrity, justice and beneficence, and respect for human beings. Yet, as Lisa Wynne in a paper published in 2017 in the Australian Journal of Anthropology, based on interviews she conducted uh, at 14 Australian universities and supplemented by an earlier global survey of over 300 anthropologists, uh, uh, Wynne concludes there are, is no empirical evidence that institutional ethics review actually protects research participants, but there is plenty of evidence that it stifles research. As uh, Lisa Wynne found, and I can personally attest to, in order to avoid problems with ethics committees, Australian anthropologists have been increasingly guiding students into low risk and thus low impact research. Regrettably, this means that entire categories of people and populations are being silenced as research participants, especially people defined as vulnerable. Lisa Wynne has argued for a radical restructuring of the whole system away from centralized punitive ethics review back to decentralized collegial ethics discussions and debate within disciplines and departments, focusing on ethical dilemmas as we are doing now, rather than ethics review. Such a restructuring would bring our own anthropological codes and guidelines more strongly into play. An issue with respect to the theme of this webinar, however, is whether any of our existing associations codes or guidelines are readily able to provide guidance for how we might deal with dilemmas that arise in the context of pandemic. It is of course important to remember that we, are, with, that we anthropologists find ourselves working in a great diversity of situations, both within and outside the academy. And therefore we face a range of situations in which difficult choices have to be made between courses of action, either or both or all of which might entail transgressing um, moral principles. In other words, we confront dilemmas not just in relation to field research, 
but in all other aspects of our lives and work. And this has come even more to the fore during the pandemic, as many of us become embroiled in ethical debates with family, friends, and colleagues, and in making judgments about the social responsibility or irresponsibility of people in relation to physical distancing, avoiding of public gatherings, wearing of masks, stigma, othering, and so on. The long question distinction between the field and home is well and truly blurred in a context where we have to confront the biological risk we pose not only to those we might regard as research participants, but to all others in our lives and they to us. Moreover, COVID-19 and the measures adopted by governments to flatten the curve have laid, laid bare deeply embedded social inequalities, exacerbated structural violence, and intensified the vulnerability of poor and marginal peoples all over the world. At its heart, anthropological ethics concerns valuing and caring for others, human and non-human. An anthropological ethics of care requires us to respond to the violence of social inequality and the failures of social justice and to work towards eliminating precarity and vulnerability by bringing the historical, political, economic sources of such violence to public attention. This imperative causes ethical dilemmas, including for some, weighing up the risk of one kind of harm against another, biological harm against socio-structural harm, in choosing whether to stay at home or to join with others in social action for change. Thank you so much, Rosita, for your input. I will now move to the next, to our next um, participant, Nico Besnier. Thank you very much. Um, I'm talking from Helsinki, actually, um, where it's nice and sunny. Uh, well, thank you, Rosita. I, I really enjoyed you. I really agreed with many of the things that you mentioned. I feel a bit awkward. Uh, let me look at the time. I feel a bit awkward representing the Netherlands because those of you who know me know that my uh, my uh, grounding in the Netherlands is quite tenuous since I'm not from there uh, and uh, I'm away quite a bit of the time. So, but I can talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, broader issues about ethics uh, in the Netherlands um, uh, and in particular the codes. Uh, I should uh, preface this by saying that um, uh, Dutch anthropology has actually been marred um, in the past by some uh, pretty uh, terrible scandals, including one very senior person about 30, 40 years ago actually inventing a field site and building his career on, uh, on that, uh, on that uh, field site that didn't exist. Uh, that if you actually Google uh, keywords, you will um, uh, get to uh, some of the details, uh, uh, particularly the, uh, the commission that was uh, uh, organized as a result. Um, so the uh, codes of ethics in the Netherlands were very much uh, originated um, as a, a response to the demands of the European Research Council, uh, which um, um, uh, requires national um, ethical clearance. Uh, it is based in institutions. I suspect that there's a code of ethics in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Dutch Anthropological Society but um, uh, I personally mostly refer to the Code of Ethics of uh, the AAA. Um, uh, and it's institutions that, um, that uh, uh, review, um, uh, review um, in, um, uh, proposals, etc. Um, uh, and so the, the, those of you who have had uh, um, experience with the ERC, know that um, they uh, essentially went, uh, the ERC, for those of you who are not uh, in Europe, is your European Research Council, uh, that it went from uh, zero to 100 in a few years, namely that there was you know, no uh, real concern with ethics at one time, and then suddenly it, it has come down with uh, enormous strength and force and, and uh, bureaucratic uh, entanglement. Um, uh, so so the, the, there are great difficulties with the ERC uh, with respect to their ethical guidelines, which are extremely technocratic uh, in the same way that they are in Australia and, and the United States. Um, very classic hard science model of, um, of uh, uh, approach. 
uh, with very little understanding of ethnography. And in fact, um, Susan Andarotsky, uh, uh, who is uh, listening in, and I organized uh, um, a workshop of principal investigators of ERC funded anthropology uh, uh, projects a few years ago to discuss some of these issues. And um, one thing that was positive uh, uh, that came out of that workshop is that uh, the person in attendance who is uh, a legal expert with the ERC um, uh, was actually reasonably positive uh, in her response to what we had, some of the difficulties that we uh, were presenting to her. Uh, I think one of the, uh, the, I think the most interesting at this point, the most timely and urgent um, uh, question that uh, is on the list of questions that uh, uh, for this uh, uh, round table is how the pandemic is, uh, is um, affecting issues of ethics as well as much more broadly uh, anthropology as a whole. Uh, and I think that ethical issues, uh, to, to echo what uh, Lucita was uh, talking about a few minutes ago, are more than ever relevant, uh, but perhaps, but certainly not in ways that ethics boards conceptualize ethics. Um, I think that uh, it behooves us, particularly those of us who are employed, uh, um, who are more senior, it behooves us to really work extremely hard to ensure uh, that early career scholars uh, are actually able to have a, a career. I mean, the, the, the early career uh, term is a, a bit of a misnomer because people, many people in that position are actually not, um, uh, not uh, uh, looking forward to, not, not uh, developing a career right now. Uh, and, and because um, uh, if they do not survive as scholars, as uh, academics, and as anthropologists, then the discipline is in great danger, which it is uh, for other reasons, including uh, um, uh, layoffs and, 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 and so on that we all know uh, throughout the world. Um, now, how do we do this is something that I, would be interesting to discuss. I think that uh, we need to pay particular attention to um, uh, helping uh, young scholars to, uh, to publish. Um, and here I have uh, my pet peeve is about journal uh, manuscript review, reviewing, which was uh, becoming so difficult to, uh, uh, to obtain from uh, some of our senior colleagues. I'm talking as the former editor of American Ethnologist here, um, you know, this real struggle to get uh, uh, people to review manuscript while in fact, most of the submitters are young people who need the publications uh, in order to launch their uh, trajectory. Um, one last thing that I will mention is uh, I've been uh, um, um, uh, somewhat uh, um, uh, surprised by the enthusiasm with which with anthropologists have um, commented on the pandemic. Uh, everybody has something to say on websites, on in, in publications and so on. And I was wondering whether actually we should just not take a step back and perhaps jump on this bandwagon of commentary uh, about how the pan pandemic is, uh, is affecting our lives, is affecting anthropology. I will stop here. Thank you. We will now go uh, to our next participant, Thomas Strong. Um, so Thomas, thank you so much. I'll give you the word. Very good. Okay. So. Um, I'm coming to you from Dublin, Ireland, and actually since 2019, there has been a legislative process unfolding which is meant to systematize and try to regularize and harmonize what has been sort of a patchwork of recognized ethics committees at the various institutions of higher education in Ireland. When I arrived here in 20, 2008, there was very little in the way of uh, um, ethical oversight. But um, as Nico observes, um, there has been quite an inflation in um, concern around ethics over this period of time. And actually, Lisa Wynn has documented a lot of this in her work. So she was referred to earlier. And I'd also like to thank, thanks everybody for asking or allowing me to participate and so on, et cetera. Um, earlier, uh, Lisa was, Lisa's work was referred to and she's published a few things sort of on the globalization of ethics audit and then 
on some of the ways in which anthropologists have responded to that and so on. And so I would like to give another shout out to her. Um, I've observed that practice unfold a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> in the midst of that, we asked Rena Letterman from Princeton, um, actually, who, um, along with Lise Dobrin, um, was um, sort of the point person for the um, interface between the American Anthropological Association and the federal revision of the common rule, which is the law that um, essentially mandated anthropologists to go through university um, IRBs in the context of the United States. So, so Rena came and, and we, had, uh, we had a fair bit of discussion around, around you know, the warning signs of what it means to really you know, become subject to hypervigilant ethics audit. Um, and and we're, it's, so a lot of us are on guard about that. Um, nevertheless, right, what really exists is not so much a national law that governs what ethics should be, um, there will be some sort of system put in place. It's going to be biomedically oriented, but rather um, each institution has its own sort of ethics committee. But um, I, I sort of just jotted some very quick notes here and, and um, in response to the questions we were asked to answer. Um, um, <clears throat> so all social life is pervaded by more or less ex tacit or explicit um, ethical considerations. And in that respect, anthropological research is no different from other aspects of sociality, right? So we were asked, does ethics govern anthropology where you are? Well, in fact, I mean, it just pervades it in the way that all life is pervaded by ethical questions. Family life, citizenship, sexual relations, and so on. Ethics do not control research. Indeed, if they did, there would never be any ethical dilemmas. Um, rather, in the words of Michel Foucault, our reflexive practice of freedom is the condition that affords our actions ethical significance as persons. So anthropology as a dis discipline systematically blurs the distinction between our professional identities as social scientists and our personal identities as individuals. So in answering that question of like, is does ethics controlled by, or is the research controlled by ethics or something, um, <clears throat> I want to draw attention to a relationship that is sometimes overlooked when we think of ethical relations. And that is the relationship one has with oneself. Um, in my own work, which has for many years focused on witchcraft violence in Papua New Guinea, um, there have been many ethical dilemmas, um, nearly constant in fact. Um, in one instance, as I witnessed a witch hunt in which violence was perpetrated against a group of women, I was dumbfounded as to what to do literally even where to sit my body, right? Like you're observing something, just where you sit seems ethically fraught, um, very, quite scary. Ultimately, what helped me to act in that instance uh, um, and doing nothing would have been a form of action was my realization that whatever I did, it would be something I would have to live with for the rest of my life. That is, it would change my relationship to myself. Um, and so I acted to try to interrupt the violence that I was witnessing. Ethics pervades anthropology not only in the conduct of fieldwork, but also in our forms of representation. Um, I am currently facing a dilemma um, that has to do with writing about gay men. So I've been involved in a year-long ethnographic research project on gay sex in Ireland, um, which has been fun. Um, who deliberately flouted the conditions of lockdown in order to have sex with each other. Um, here are the ethics and politics of representation insofar as they resist or join up with the representational conventions that have long oppressed gay men. For example, notions that we are reckless and promiscuous and so on, collide with the imperative I believe we have to tell the truth. So that's the sort of ethical question around writing and representation. Which brings me to the last question that we were asked about, which has to do with COVID-19 and how it bears on the future of anthropological ethics. I'm entirely, I'm entirely unclear about this uh, uh, because um, there is so much uncertainty about what's happening, you know. Um, somebody's already urged perhaps a, a, some circumspection and perhaps uh, some waiting to see what is going on before we decide to say anything. Um, I, that's not necessarily a bad idea, I think. 
But the first thing I would say, nonetheless, is that we need to hear from anthropologists who've suffered from the virus. So um, I saw this as an HIV positive anthropologist who has read many very impressive books about HIV by anthropologists who are HIV negative. Uh, but there are profound ways in which occupying the category of the thing talked about, where the problem is not out there amongst others, but rather in here with us right now, radically shifts um, our perception of any particular social phenomenon, of course, and in, that includes disease. I can recall countless seminars and lectures where HIV was assumed to be outside the room, right? Um, that unstated but clear assumption spoke volumes and often had a kind of silencing effect on me, um, one that I sometimes rather loudly resisted, as for example right now. So we need anthropologists with the disease or recovering from having survived um, <clears throat> to document their experiences to the extent that they can. We need to hear from those of you, you anthropologists out there with COVID-19, or having um, survived COVID-19 and so on, um, we need to hear from you. I, I think that's one sort of ethical imperative of anthropology in this regard. Second, we must remain critical of lockdown and of the government powers it manifests. So I would also insist on this as an ethical imperative. The kind of risk society that Mary Douglas and Ulrich Beck were theorizing decades ago, in which a political discourse masked a scientific mandate shapes all social life, um, has truly come to pass. In this context, I think the ethical position for anthropologists may require us to defy mandates rather than to acquiesce to them. Um, certainly, we mustn't harm others. Um, but lockdown and so so social isolation have created enormous harms themselves, and they are ongoing. Anthropologists should be open to the possibility that for us to be ethical, we must embrace what our discipline has always taught us, that human being comes through forms of mutual recognition that sometimes includes close proximity, touch, care, sex. Um, indeed, the recognition of common humanity that occurs during funerals, um, let us say, since the curtailing of funeral rites during this pandemic um, has been amongst its most devastatingly inhuman aspects. An anthropological ethic might mean refusing the mandates of the experts who arrogate to themselves the ability to speak the truth of this epidemic, and it might mean making Antigone's claim our own. Thanks again. We will now move on to our colleague from Brazil, uh, Luiz Duarte. I will unmute myself and give you a word. Thank you so much. Well, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you all for the invitation. Um, uh, I'll tackle uh, the three dimensions of the uh, ethics in, so in, in anthropology the problem that, is, uh, that we are dealing with today. Uh, the first one is the, is the situation in Brazil as concerns the evaluations, the, the, the clearances system for um, research practice. Uh, we have had a very difficult situation in Brazil since uh, at least a decade, because uh, um, a, a, a national, a centralized national system was created. Um, it's very, it's entirely based upon bioethics, of course, as usual, it's a planetary plague. And, uh, and uh, it has been trying to uh, sub subordinate all the humanities and the social sciences to its uh, dictates, to its uh, precepts. Um, so we have, we have um, had to, 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 to have a, a very consistent struggle against that uh, authoritarian rule. But we have so far not been able to have some success. This centralized system is they still exists, and we are formally uh, submitted to it. Um, 
in spite of all the struggle we have uh, uh, used uh, during this, these last years, um, we, we have not been able to put in practice a, a, a new system or a more decentralized system in the place of that uh, uh, terrible centralized uh, system. Um, so the, the, the most uncomfortable dilemma involved uh, in, in our case in Brazil is not so much the myriad the concrete challenges faced by the anthropologists in the work with small-scale societies, urban problems, transgressive behavior, mystical experience, secret rituals, or political dissent. But in fact, the moral dilemma of having to submit to unqualified judges uh, our projects that one knows cannot bend to their formal requirements and to have to feign to comply so as to be able to proceed to the field and face the real dilemmas of our work. Uh, this uh, situation in Brazil is particularly authoritarian and uh, I suppose we'll still have to, to, to fight for uh, quite uh, uh, a few other years uh, in order to, to, to put in place uh, a more convenient uh, system. The, 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 the most difficult aspect of it is that the, the political situation in Brazil, as you all probably know, has been entirely in a mess. And it's very difficult to discuss with the federal uh, government authorities uh, so as to change the, the situation, the present situation. I, I did my best to do that. Uh, I spoke at the Chamber of Deputies, etc. But uh, so ministers change, government uh, displaces its interests, and, and it's, uh, it has not so far, we have not so far been, been successful. You, you were asking also uh, for some information regarding uh, the the national associations. The Brazil, in fact, the, the Brazilian uh, Anthropological Association uh, has a code of ethics of the anthropologist, as it's called. It has been revised. It was created in the 1980s, and it has been recently revised in 2012. And it's very, very clear about the rights of anthropologists, the rights of the populations that are objects of research, and uh, the responsibilities of anthropologists. And it's, uh, I think, very, very correct. But um, the Brazilian Anthropological Association is not a professional institution. It's, uh, it's an academic institution, so it does not have any, any legal um, thing, authority uh, to, to conduct, to, to organize, conduct, or, or uh, sanction any uh, transgression to its, to its rules, to its code. Uh, in fact, uh, w one point we have been stressing uh, consist insistently in these last years is that instead of a centralized national system, we should have the inclusion of the discussion about ethics in social sciences during the formative years of our trainees and not in the formal clearance system. This reflective practice that uh, uh, by Foucault, met, uh, that uh, uh, Thomas mentioned it, should be uh, a, a, an important uh, uh, an important dimension of this uh, position. I think uh, we should proceed uh, in the direction of education in ethics rather than regulation and uh, and uh, uh, well these these clearance systems. As regards the pandemic uh, in Brazil, we have been involved, anthropologists, I mean, we have been involved in political support to underprivileged groups uh, that have been so heavily uh, challenged by, 
the, the, the conditions, the, the national conditions in Amazonia, in the, with the, the tribal societies, we have the, the maroon societies, the quilombolas, uh, with uh, the urban poverty uh, groups in, in the metropolis. And uh, so, in fact, I don't think we have been reflecting a lot, uh, much about uh, how it, uh, it, um, it concerns research in itself, but rather the political support to the people we are, uh, in fact, in contact in our research areas. Uh, and this has been very difficult given the characteristics of the present, um, um, well, quite authoritarian, rightist, uh, almost fascist government. And uh, so we have been concentrating rather in this, in this dimension. Well, this is, these are just a few informations about uh, the situation here uh, so that the discussion may proceed in more um, in instructive uh, dimensions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, we will now move to Patricia, Patricia Torres Mejia from Mexico. Thank you. Yes, okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Patricia Castañeda, the head of our association, Anthropological Association in Mexico. I would like to start saying that it took us a long time have a code of ethics in our association, a professional association. Why? Because there was a lot of discussion if it could become a kind of um, inquisitorial uh, attitude. Who, is, who has the right to say, to say what is wrong and what is right? And I think that is a question that is being asked from the South normally. What is ethics? Ethics is for us certain principles maybe from the Hellenic times, Foucault says it, and um, it is Platon who first talked about it, and it was related to class, to the formation of, of class, the differentiations in society. So in Mexico, we, we start to think about it, we always question who has the right to talk about ethics, the people we study with or us, the anthropologists, because we work in the nation and we are together. In any case, what we decided to do, and we have a code, is more a set of um, good practices rather than things that we should do. We place our attention to the good practices, and we work very close together with a big uh, network of um, 32 institutions that form anthropologists, that teach anthropology and form future anthropologists, in order to start talking about the ethics from the very beginning. So it's an issue that is coming and going, but we kind of refuse loss because we are very much aware in our country that what we think about a norm or a law is there to be broken, is there to be corrupted, because it's all constantly done in our society and it's a vice that we have to remove from our society. So when we talk about, uh, about ethics, what kind of ethics we're talking about? European form, panic form, the practice of people, so we prefer to talk about morale. Morale is the practice, the practice of what we do. So in those terms, we do discuss, as Aida Hernandez was saying in the previous talk, what, what we have to listen to the other, especially when we are working always on very difficult situations, especially when you're working on violence like myself or in feminist with a feminist critique as per perspective, or where you're working with workers, uh, with obreros in a factory, with the syndicates or, or sindicatos, unions, you're always there talking about others. What can we say about the others that won't harm them? Now we're, we're speaking in, in the situation with a biological harm, but the harm has been there always. What do we say that people might get offended by others. A, a paper I recently wrote about that, no? When we talk about the others, when we talk about the others, what are we really saying about the others and what is going to harm their situation? I am working, I, I was working in the Philippines under martial law. What could I say that would harm the, the Filipino people with whom, with, with who, whoever I was speaking with, there was a risk. There was always a risk involved because 
they might think that I was there talking about them or my, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I just lost it. I decided in the Philippines not to put a single name of my informants in my diaries. I decided not to even ask their names. I decided, be, why? Because if my papers or my, my notes were taken away, all that information was, would, would, could harm people. Now I'm working with women that um, were in prison because they sell, uh, art, uh, they'll, they'll sell things at night with their children. That's the only job they have in order to not to leave their babies or their young children at home. So what I'm trying to say is that if I talk, I, I receive a very, very good information. I have a very good information about them. If I do say what they are doing, some people will take it as, as immoral and they don't think it's immoral. For them, it's immoral to leave their children alone or with someone else at home. For our society, it's immoral to bring the children at two o'clock in the morning to sell things in a bar. So that is a problem that we are facing now. And I think that problem is also, as we're saying, with the coronavirus situation, with the pandemic. We, I was doing fieldwork when the pandemic started, so I had to leave. I had to, to, to get away from the field site. And I was so scared that women that I knew were under a, a lot of violence within their households were going to live with the, with the, with the, with the guy that was, that was hitting them and they were trying to get away. Now they couldn't. So they were locked down with the man that was going to maybe kill her or harm her. I was really scared. I couldn't do anything because we couldn't move. So those things for me were more, there was an ethical concern for myself, but a big issue for the other people. I will continue with this topic in the next time because I don't want to take more time. No, it's the four or five minutes. Thank you so much. So we finished the first round. We have on the chat, if you are able to see a lot of discussion already going on, really a lot. And people are intervening, uh, talking about issues like the problems of uh, visibility of research uh, from certain countries in comparison to research coming from uh, researchers from other countries. They are talking about the different codes of ethics to use, which ones to use. Should the uh, codes of ethics that are used in countries and they are not respecting indigenous rights or lands. And I think, uh, in my opinion, Thomas Strong's um, example was very keen to the point because as anthropologists, we also have to use our common sense. Because Guy, for me, as I, I'm just going to say this as president of the Portuguese Anthropological Associations, we do not have a code of ethics because we've discussed this thoroughly and we thought that in certain senses, a code of ethics can also be a drawback in the sense that it will be, a, a, you know, like a, keeping you from doing things that in certain situations you should do, like Thomas mentioned. So I don't know, just look at the chat and all these questions that I went through and, and, and let's go back to, to all of you. So we'll start with Rosita again and, and see how we can relate what you explained first to all the questions and discussion that is going on in the chat. Okay, I, I, I haven't been able to follow the chat as, as well as I, I should be able to try to scroll through it all. Um, but uh, yes, so what some of the questions have been around ethics codes and, um, and the fact that um, the ethics codes of anthropologists aren't necessarily respecting the ethical codes of the people uh, among whom we might work or when we move to different, uh, when field work is done in different countries, um, researchers coming and not actually um, respecting um, the particular um, conditions or the, the conditions um, uh, under which it, uh, research should be conducted in that particular place. Um, so um, I, I thought I would uh, just talk about the fact that the um, uh, work established this ethics, since I'm the chair of the ethics uh, task force, um, talk about the fact that uh, Waka established this task force in 2012. And the first task of the task force was to review uh, existing um, ethics guidelines of Waka member associations, not to establish any kind of general code for everyone to follow, um, but uh, as an aim to reveal the, the, the principles uh, that we might all have in common in our work and how our codes might differ. Uh, particularly with respect to particular local situations. Um, and so how, how can we actually respect those 
the, the local codes of ethics of the uh, association, the anthropological associations, which really are supposed to be sensitive to the countries in which they work. So hopefully, you know, the the Australian anthropological code is is is, is sensitive to the particular conditions uh, under which anthropologists work in Australia and the political context uh, and, uh, and cultural context of working with, for example, Indigenous Australians. So the aim was to, to show what, to think about what we might all have in common and what we could learn from, from each other. Uh, more recently, the Ethics Task Force has created working paper series to disseminate information about ethics issues of concern to anthropologists and, and our associations worldwide and to share ideas and elicit discussion and feedback. And these will be published on the Waka website. And so far we've received and edited and reviewed three papers with another two promised. And one of these papers is entitled Ethics, Histories and Redress, Ethical Orientations in the Southern African Context. And that's written by Ethics Task Force member Fiona Ross. And it's particularly relevant, I think, to today's webinar and to some of the questions that have been raised in the, in the chat. Fiona concludes her paper by arguing that it is imperative for anthropology to develop a non-paternalist ethics of care. And she start, wrote this paper um, at the beginning stages of, of the COVID-19 pandemic when borders were closing. And she was like many of us in the midst of advising her research students who were being urged to by their governments and universities to return home from their various field sites. Um, Fiona reflects on the dilemmas she and her students are confronting really questioning who is the anthropologist to, you know, how do we define who an anthropologist is? Is an anthropologist always an outsider? And um, she's, uh, and so she reflects on these kind of dilemmas they were confronting in this rapidly changing context of COVID-19, uh, where, and I quote her, new ethical concerns arise, including whether research of the kind we have taken for granted as ethnographic is even viable. Um, in the previous uh, Waka webinar, where we discussed the impact of the pandemic on ethnographic fieldwork, the alternative of virtual or online ethnographic research, uh, which has already been well you know, tested by many anthropologists, uh, was considered. But such research, of course, raises its own ethical issues, the need to consider risks for participants online. Some of us, uh, Thomas was expressing some concern about even this particular webinar. Uh, so uh, what do security concerns uh, over the sophisticated online surveillance techniques used by governments and corporations now increasingly employed to contain the spread of COVID-19 mean for research ethics and for our ability to guarantee participants informed consent, confidentiality, anonymity, all the things that are written into our various codes. Uh, but there's also another kind of ethical dilemma that confronts some of us in the requirement to switch to research online, even if temporarily. One of my own students, uh, Alicia Wheatley, who before the pandemic had just begun fieldwork in a shipyard in Costa Rica, recently sent me a piece she entitled uh, with a question mark, flattening the curve without flattening anthropology. Uh, Alicia has given permission for me to share her concerns here and I'll just read out a little piece of her writing. Nowadays, hours away from that dusty shipyard and in the midst of uncertain pandemic overwhelm, my eyes aroused to the liveliness of local lives like the cute jungle road and Thurguti trotting past my window as I pitter patter these words from my brain to the keyboard, to the screen. The treasured and textured intricacies of anthropological contributions emerge out of complex in situ multi-sensory engagements with the worlds and lives that brush against us. Us being the researchers, more than humans, and unique worldly inhabitants hoping to move a little closer to something. But intimacy takes living breaths of time, generosity and compassion. It takes presence. It takes slow, gentle criticality, particularly against the forces of our own desires to make things make sense. It takes deep listening. It takes embodiment. It takes everything that springs from intellect and then shakes it up, leaving you gazing at the grains of dirt submerged under your nails. Conducting research online forces me into the world of intellect and robs me of the embodied liveliness of the senses that erupt through relational interactions. It is all too easy to form conclusions from afar, from behind indifferent screens, with tranquil lulls of tropical birds, a fresh coffee and clean nails. I wrestle with the possibilities of an intellect that is trapped away from the worlds that it is supposed to carry and hold. I struggle 
with the unethics of distorted language, disconnected symbols, and the absence of bodies, sounds, and emotions that would usually birth the spectrum of, a spectrum of an anthropology that is rooted in its own hue of dirt. So that's from um, Alicia. History reveals that increased attention is given to ethics, especially during times of crisis, and the many blogs, Facebook, Instagram posts to be found online, mostly by young anthropologists, as well as this present webinar are evidence of this. The crisis caused by COVID-19 has given us reason to reflect critically on our ethical responsibilities as anthropologists and issues of power, knowledge and relationship or co-creation of knowledge and relationship that come into play in our research. Let me end here by quickly reading the closing paragraph of the Code of Ethics of the Association of Social Anthropologists of New Zealand, which I really like. And I quote, in the final analysis, anthropological research is a human undertaking dependent upon choices for which the individual bears ethical as well as scientific responsibility. That responsibility is a human, not superhuman one. To err is human. To forgive is humane. These principles of professional responsibility and ethical conduct provide guidelines which can minimize the occasions upon which there is a need to forgive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosita. Uh, we will go now to the next speaker. So we'll follow the same order. So Nico, your turn again. Thank you. <clears throat> I won't be very loquacious. Um, I'll just ad address a couple of things. I actually try to um, uh, contribute to the very, very uh, active uh, chat, uh, but I, by mistake, I sent my comment to uh, a single person. So um, <laughs> that shows how um, um, technologically uh, adept I am. Um, so I think there was something really interesting that Maxi and Mariano, uh, hello to both of you, um, uh, raised, namely, you know, why should uh, one refer to AAA? Isn't that uh, uh, yet another instance of hegemony of the hegemony of uh, North America and the United States in particular? Um, I mean, I, I was actually half expecting uh, that challenge, and I thank you both for making it. Um, I think that we need to, uh, at the same time, recognize that the AAA has a very, you know, decades-long history of thinking about some of these issues. The Code of Ethics and now the Guidelines for Ethics have gone through multiple um, uh, revisions, and, you know, they're much older, and the, and they are the product of, uh, th th than European ones. Uh, and they're the product of um, uh, sort of the intellectual input of multiple people who are, uh, many of whom, not all, uh, are quite aware of issues of hegemony. Uh, so I think that, um, I mean, Tom um, mentioned uh, uh, Raina Lederman and Lise Do uh, Dobrin as, as uh, uh, we actually, uh, Susanna and I and uh, Anita Hardon invited them both when we were uh, conducting our ERC project uh, because they have so much to say about ethics. That so, and we, in Europe, for example, I can't think of anyone who has the sort of the intellectual engagement with issues of ethics that these two have. Uh, so it's unfortunate that they come from a very hegemonic country, one in which anthropology has been extremely hegemonic uh, uh, traditionally um, uh, and, uh, um, but, uh, you know, I think that's the, I think we need to reckon with the fact that, 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 that we need to sort of see what is intellectually a, a very sophisticated product. I see that, uh, Mugsy, you mentioned, uh, my question is actually a way of pointing to ES's lack of any guidelines. Well, that is, um, uh, I, I don't have um, any, uh, any comment on this. I, I've actually been, I mean, I have one foot in, on each side of the Atlantic and a third one also in Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, so uh, um, I, I realize that they're, you know, the, the dynamics are different, but at the same time that um, taking the best of what everyone can produce, I think is, is the route to take. Some of the issues that, that were brought up, I mean, are sort of very classic, uh, 
uh, dilemmas about uh, about ethics, which, as we all know, the guidelines, uh, whichever guidelines we follow, are very poorly designed to issues of power. Um, issue, I mean, a lot of ethic guidelines assume this concept of community, don't have the community where you're working, but who is the community and what are the harm, what is the harm that is going on within those commu communities? Uh, so, I mean, I think these are very, very important, unresolvable question that all of us need, need to contend with. I think Tom was referring, I couldn't hear very uh, well uh, some of what you said, Tom, but uh, I seem to, I, I guess that you were referring to um, uh, uh, um, uh, incidents during your field work where that kind of thing was okay, was uh, was taking uh, was was at the forefront of what you were of your position vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, the people. So um, uh, you know, I think that that we can only continue to to talk uh, to talk about these things uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, and I think that. Uh, Virginia, you said earlier that the AAA had, uh, he would, no, uh, that the AAA had, uh, now this provides resources. I have your message here. Ra rather than rewriting the formal uh, ethics guidelines, you say code of ethics, I think has been changed to uh, ethics guidelines a couple, a couple of decades ago. Um, and I think that's really quite interesting because I think everybody realizes that uh, that uh, resources might actually be a much better um, font of, uh, of inspiration uh, than, um, uh, than an actual sort of statement, but at the same time, and, and one that actually could, could be much more uh, um, utilized, much, much better resource for ut its utilization in different national, uh, cultural, political contexts. Um, I will stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nico. Uh, the next one is once again, um, Thomas. Uh, so, please. I mean, there's a huge number of interesting discussions going on here having to do with over in the question and answer area, which a number of topics. So uh, difficult to know what to say, although I made one remark, which is that we have a, a, this like growing subdisciplinary field, the anthropology of ethics or the anthropology of morality and ethics, um, which is really interesting um, and um, um, quite sophisticated. I would actually include Rena Letterman's work in that. And her focus tends to be on the distinctive disciplinary ethics of anthropology vis-a-vis -vis other forms of inquiry um, and the difficulties that causes. Um, there was a special issue of American Ethnologist um, that was called, um, it was about uh, uh, troubled or troubling lines between work and life, which had to do with the fact that the premise of ethnography is that it deliberately blurs work and life. And, and that is something that makes ethics protocols, um, which assume a certain sort of division or like, now I'm wearing my anthropology hat, so I'm governed by this code. And now I'm wearing my normal hat, you know, um, it, 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 it absurd. It obviates that distinction, right? So, so um, um, it, there's really um, a lot of difficulty given the nature of what anthropology is to codification, basically, um, in any particular national setting a, as a set of rules, you know, or whatever. Either that, or they just have to be so vague as to be unhelpful. Um, and you know, I happen to agree with people who think that that in many ways, the, 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 the hoop, the idea that you're going, th you, you just do the ethics committee, you get their letter, and then your ethics are done. I mean, I can't tell you how, I mean, almost every single researcher I ever encounter has this sort of tacit assumption. Oh yes, I got the approval, this is all ethical, you know? 
Um, no, the ethics are with you every second you are doing the work, especially for ethnographic workers, so uh, field workers. So, so, so I, I feel like there's a tension there. And in fact, in many ways, ethics audit contributes to a kind of deadening of the problem of the ethical with respect to um, ethnographic field work, especially, but also including um, ethnographic writing. Um, we need to remember that, the, that there are implications in the representations we generate. You know, they circulate back to the people they represent. They say things about them that maybe governments want or don't want to hear, and so on. They get involved in legal cases, et cetera. So, um, you know, the, I was talking about the witchcraft work. I am paralyzed all the time by the fact that I know that my, that, you know, that anything I publish that is about any particular instance of violence, and we're talking about, you know, people being burned to death and things like that, um, accused witches, um, will enter into a cycle of payback as evidence, right? Um, I cannot anonymize it. I can't, you know, and that is, that's really paralyzing. Um, and I've really been struggling with how to overcome that. Um, <clears throat> But if co if codes are not really the thing that fixes the, the, it for us, and I would claim that maybe they don't, maybe they're too simplistic or, or too embedded in their particular contexts of articulation, then maybe what we should talk about are th this idea of virtue ethics, the inculcation of a certain set of virtues, kindness, caring, you know, attentiveness of a certain kind, um, such that when ethical dilemmas are encountered by the anthropologist, they have the disposition, the ethical disposition to do the right thing, right? Um, and this is sort of a different model. It's not this sort of like rule oriented model. It's this idea of a, of a, of a kind of um, ethos or a, a habitus that has a certain kind of ethical dimension to it. Um, um, and so actually, what I usually tell my students at, around dilemmas and so on is that if you encounter it as an ethical problem, that is, if you recognize that it has ethical dimensions, then you're going to make a choice and the choice that is probably the right one. Um, it's when you're not aware, it's when you are oblivious to those implications or when you refuse to see them that the, the, the problem arises. So I tell students, you know, it, it, I, I can't answer the question for you. I can't tell you what the ethical thing is. Um, but uh, if you're asking the question, you will think through it in a way that I think will lead you to an ethical choice that you can leave, li live with. Um, um, so um, um, uh, that's, that would be something that I would contribute. So, and, and I would just ask the vast, you know, the people here with a vast knowledge of, of anthropology. I mean, do they, are there ways in which the anthropology of ethics is being taken on board by anthropological associations purporting to describe the, the ethical implications or govern the ethical implications of anthropology? I, I'm not aware that it is, and, and I'm sort of curious about that question. Uh, Thomas, thank you once again for all this um, bringing up some of the issues that have been this being discussed on the chat. So I'll move now to Luis. Uh, I have been uh, finding difficult to follow at the same time the talking and the, the chat. And so well, I'll try to, to, to pick up a few questions that I could uh, uh, see in the, in the chat list. Um, one of them was uh, um, from Sus Susanna Narodsky uh, when she says that ethics and politics are in, in embedded one in another. And uh, of course, she's, she's, she's right. And, uh, she, but she's right in several, it, this is an assertion that is right in several lines and several levels, uh, different lines and levels and uh, some more explicit and some more implicit. And uh, I think it's a, a too general an assertion to uh, really uh, uh, help us in our, in our discussion. Uh, I think the more important in this case is the, the next question. I think it was, uh, well, Carmen Rial and some, someone else asked what the difference 
could be could exist between ethics in biomedicine and social sciences, and the, particularly uh, the education uh, in biomedicine and uh, social sciences about ethics. Uh, the fact is that uh, the, the development of uh, bioethics as a, as a dimension of biomedicine, a, a reflexive and critical uh, dimension of biomedicine, was a, a very important uh, event. And uh, it has been taught regularly at uh, uh, medicine faculties and schools. And, um, and it's, it's, it's grown in importance in all the in all the, um, the system and the, the establishment of biomedicine, but uh, at the same time, it has in, inherited. Some, sometimes I have said this. Uh, it has inherited the, the arrogance of bio, of medicine and the arrogance of philosophy, and it uh, displays its its uh, its tenets in a, in a very authoritarian way and certainly not adequate to social sciences. On the other side, in social sciences, we, we have uh, certainly for decades uh, included in our, uh, in our work a certain ethical dimension. Of course, ever, I, I don't think any anthropologist, any anthropologist did ever do fieldwork without taking decisions making choices about what to do here and there. And this is ethics. Well, maybe they did not make the, the proper choices very often. And uh, this is due, I think, not to the absence or presence of formal clearance systems, but of uh, the education, education that should be included formally in the training of social of anthropologists as in sociologists, any of the social sciences and the humanities, <laughs> all these disciplines that have to deal with uh, uh, human uh, interlocutors. Um, the absence of this training is, is really, I think, the greatest problem among us, uh, because we have to create out of nothing, or perhaps out of the, the the, the experience we have from, the, from reading monographs and the books and descriptions of field work, etc., uh, accumulated all over this, this century of uh, anthropology uh, existence. But uh, we have to improvise. Uh, instead, we should be trained to think about what we do in a very systematic way. Uh, the development of a self scrutiny. Uh, process. I think Thomas was uh, stressed at this point in, the, in his first uh, talk, um, the development of, uh, of an experience of uh, uh, observation of oneself, because ethics is, is there, it inhabits that dimension, that, that uh, area of our uh, uh, personal experience. It's an internal question, question after all. Uh, of course, it has all the external uh, results and uh, uh, that can be traced, but it is a for, uh, fundamentally uh, 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 an internal problem, uh, 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 an ethical, personal problem. Um, well, uh, 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 Thomas now uses the expression being aware. Of course, I think being aware is essentially what we should be uh, trained to. Of course, it's not only a question of training, of formal training, but formal training might, uh, well, propitiate a certain amount of this uh, uh, self-scrutiny, self-observation that is essential for going on uh, in, in uh, anthropological research. Uh, because. Of course, as someone has said to, to today, um, ethics is not only a problem of uh, anthropological research, it's a vital problem, it's a problem in our whole life. And so this training, this self-scrutiny is, uh, is basic for, for all dimensions. We cannot be ethic, ethical in, in the field, in the anthropological field, and not ethical in other dimensions of our, our 
our lives. Of course, political conditions, etc., Susanna, uh, would be mingled there and uh, enmeshed in this in this these uh, life situations. But uh, uh, I, I I insist on the point of self uh, of being aware of of this personal, internal, interior awareness. Um, the, the, the last point I would like to, to address is, the, is the, the question that Rosita uh, brought uh, to our attention uh, concerning research online. It, this has been growing, uh, of course, for several reasons before the pandemic, uh, because certain situations, certain social phenomena uh, cannot be observed, but in the in the uh, online uh, situation, so uh, uh, this, it, uh, of course, the, the the complaint of your student was very touching. But uh, in the in of course the direct contact, uh, bodily contact, uh, sensorial, uh, emotional contact with our interlocutors is so essential to the development of a, of. A, uh, a good social anthropology, but some things can be uh, can be studied very very conveniently in the in online situations conditions. I have uh, uh, I have um, uh, supervised a few theses and dissertations uh, in that in that direction. But uh, what I, sh I should like to stress is the fact that re research online uh, challenges us. In, in several new aspects of ethics, uh, what, what should be considered, considered as private and public in this, uh, in chats and uh, Facebooks and et cetera, is, is, a, is a permanent and difficult problem uh, that has been faced in a very, in a very um, well, not a very organized way. Perhaps we should be more concerned about the, these new conditions of research that may eventually be important for a social anthropology. Thank you. I will now pass the word to Patricia, please. Thank you very much. Um, yes, somebody was mentioning the crisis, I think, was a crisis brings opportunities. And it is certainly true. Ma many of the big new, um, even paradigms in our field, are caused by crisis and by this uh, criticized notion of otherness, which is very difficult for us Mexicans working in Mexico, uh, try to build up or, but in any case, yes, opportunities. And I went just to raise what Rosita was saying. I love what the, the student wrote. Thank you very much for sharing it with us and for allowing, for her allowing us to, to listen to it online. I, as I told you, was doing research when the pandemic started. And I knew that I was, I had to leave because people where I was living in the house where I was residing, I knew they, they, they thought they were in charge of me. They accepted me to be in their house. I am the foreigner, I am the visitor. They know what I'm doing. I always show all my, my project to them. I share with them, I discuss with them. But in any case, I felt that if I stayed and I, if I got sick, it was a problem for them. Not that I will make them sick, the problem is that they will have to take care of me. And that was my big ethical dilemma. I could have stayed, I could, but if I got sick, if somebody, I mean, so, so I decide, and I'm old, 69 years old, that is in a dangerous situation for my age, so I, I decided to leave. And I started to continue my research online, and I couldn't agree more with what you were saying, uh, Luis. What were the ethics then? Could I record them? I should ask. I was using the telephone because everybody has a cell phone nowadays, mostly, most, most of So I decided to pay for the phone or should I use their line? Should I ask them to, when I, 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 I hardly take notes, I always take notes, I hardly use the tape recorder. I, so they see what I'm writing of what they are saying. Most of the people that work can read and write. Or they ask me, you didn't, Put it correctly, put it right. I said, this is not that we write. In any case, what I'm saying is now I cannot do it online. I don't know what I can write, what I cannot write, if I should record or not record. And if I should interfere into their Facebooks, because I am part of them, because they invited me. So I can see what they are writing about, 
when should I, how could I harm them if I use that data? How do I know if they are just pretending something different, which a lot of them do. They joy, they, the, the, the joy of, of being a, a, in Facebook is that they, they can pretend that they are prettier, that they are more, that they dance differently, the music they never hear, or they pretend they went to a bar, which they don't have access to it because they are underage. So all those things are, we demand to more, do more, um, I, I will say, a methodology more about, uh, around epistemology or discourse analysis. So it's different, yes, it's a different question, not just, it's a new opportunity, just, not just for, for ethics. It's a new opportunity to see how do we put ourselves inside without harming again. And I think, yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Thomas, for bringing it up. We are always ethical, or I would say morale, because ethics for me, as I said, is very difficult to, to reach because I say, how can we decolonize ethics? Because we are in a country, I work in, in countries where with marginalized people, that they laugh about the ethical issues because if they did the norms that they are supposed to follow, like uh, Peter and Jason Adler were talking about the mafia, no? If we did follow with the, uh, the principles in, in, in Southern Sicily, the moral principles, there won't be a mafia. But mafia what has different codes, and that's what I found. Marginal people, poor people, uh, people in prison, they have different codes, moral codes, to express why they did what, why they should have, why they did what they did, what they should have uh, done, what they, what they did is correct. So that's what I'm trying to point out with what I'm saying, that uh, we are dealing with people explaining their lives with a different kind of code than the one we have. Of course, we don't want to harm them. And as Thomas said, I always paralyze myself when I think, shall I write, write about tax evasion? Shall I write about stealing electricity? How they steal water from the, from the state because they don't have access to water? Or shall I write how they steal from each other during nighttime in order to have some money to feed their children the following day? So all these things are hard for me to, to explain to others. And I know that the others that are going to read me have a Christian morality, a Jewish Christian morality that will say, oh my God, what kind of people you're working with? I mean, of course, we're the, I am working with people that were in the Philippines under martial law. So they had to change their names, of course. They had to evade, evade, evade the, the, the state. And, did I sympathize, sympathize with them? Of course I did, but they were killing people too. They were killing militaries. Did I sympathize with that, with killing people? Did I sympathize, do I sympathize with the women that are um, using their children in a way, using, not abusing, using their children because they know that they don't leave them behind, but they can immediately realize that a tourist will give them more uh, money for a bracelet or for chewing gum if the baby is with them, that if they were alone. And that's something people need to realize. So there are the two codes together. Why the child is, you know, the, the child is outside and the human rights situation. And finally, they went to jail you know, because they were taking their children to sell with them. So that kind of situation is a dilemma that is constantly there. And I would say to Luis, we, what, how we teach in uh, our, our society, our anthropological society, we teach a course on ethics. And we don't teach ethics itself, we work on dilemmas. What will you do? And the basic dilemma is, what do people are responding when they are doing something that they know is not the correct thing for the law, or for the Catholic church, or for whatever church they go to, or even for the school system in which they work? So that is the dilemma. We live in a very unequal society an extremely inequality and class society. And we have lots of uh, problems dealing with, um, with the inequality and discrimination and being poor is not easy. And we are observing most of the time people being poor. And when we're working on the other side, which I did, oh my God, when I work with merchants, with the, oh, the, the dealers of uh, tobacco in the Philippines, my, they are worse, they are worse ethical than any single, human being that I was working with. I mean, they tax evasion, of course they do tax evasion, but at large, not a little tiny thing of not paying the electricity. That is something very different. So we live in a society that has an ethical 
situation, an ethical discourse, and human rights, individual human rights, but constantly we are facing that disruption and the abuse and the ignore, ignorance, not ignorance, ignoring those principles in order to make a profit, in order to have pleasure. In order, so that is what the anthropology is observing. Of course, we have to be very careful of not harming people. I mean, we are ethical, we presume we're ethical, but we never really know. I, I agree with Thomas, we are in a big dilemma constantly. I, I say that is my main problem when I'm doing research. And when I send my students to do research, of course I do the same. Think that you're not harming. Think it as a dilemma. And as we said, uh, as I said before, we think not in virtues, but in good practices of anthropology. Not in things we shouldn't do, good practices. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, Patricia. I, I was listening to you and thinking that's exactly why we named this webinar specifically ethical dilemmas in anthropological research, because that's exactly what you said. We often face dilemmas in our work and uh, the dilemmas are faced in everyday uh, work, um, not only in the structural sense of the code of ethics, but exactly on field work, uh, everyday field work. So, um, okay, we've, we've gone through everyone twice. I will now open the floor to, so no, no specific order. Of course, we've had so many comments and questions and discussion on chat. It's really long and a, a lot of people participating, which is great. Uh, we've gone through almost one and a half hour of, of um, webinars, so I don't wanna you know, uh, keep this going on too long, but still, I would like to open the floor and see if any of the participants wants to come back to the spotlight and, and you know, come back to some of the issues that the other participants or someone from the audience in the chat has, um, has commented on. I just wanted to ask a question about um, the fact that um, you know, many anthropologists are actually working not in the field and for many of us don't get to the field. Even, uh, even before COVID-19, we're working within universities, overworked within universities. <laughs> Um, and, and, and in a, a neo neoliberal corporatized university. In, um, so uh, what, what, are, what is the ethical dilemmas that we face as anthropologists working in, within these institutions in regard to, um, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where the universities are, are, are dealing with the pandemic in particular ways. Um, and there's a lot of fear, there's a culture of fear in many universities about loss of jobs, um, a lot, particularly loss of positions of, of what we what is called the precariat, all of the um, um, you know casual casualization of the university casual staff and so on. So what are what are our dilemmas in that regard in terms in terms of being able to speak out or speak up, um, you know, for others? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just thought it's a different context for our work. And, 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 a, and a very real one that we're all in, well, many of us, many of us are not working within the university sector, but uh, that we're embroiled in. Thank you, Rosita. Uh, Luis? Yes, it's, it's just a, sh a short footnote to a point uh, raised by Patricia now. Uh, it's the question of the, the training in, in ethics uh, that I had mentioned before. I don't think of of course, in a, in a formal training of preceptors, uh, rules, etc. I think of, and, and, and I have done this in some, in some seminars, uh, an analysis of anthropological work. The reading even Spritchard or Michael Talsig or uh, Talal Assad and uh, analyzing what they did in certain circumstances and, uh, and uh, was that the best uh, solution? Did they act uh, properly in uh, in, this, in, the, uh, in in relation to what we, we know about uh, the field uh, described in that work? Uh, th this is a, is a very, I think this is an embodied um, uh, way to to see uh, di these dilemmas we are, we are dealing with here today uh, in practice. Thank you. Patricia, yeah. Please. I couldn't raise my hand in this place. But I was, I was thinking of what Rosita said about fear. Yes, I think that um, it's very difficult for me. There have been many, many conversatories about the pandemic. I think the first one, the first one online was organized by Ricardo Faguaga and uh, our Association of Anthropologists as early as in March. 
March 5, very early. And it was, it was fantastic because it was just the beginning of the closing of the society and closing us in, in our house, if we did that. No? And the richness of the uh, opportunity brought, for me was surprising. I thought people will be saying just simple things. No. Certainly, I, I recommend all of us to listen to all these conversatories. I have, I have attended already like 15, believe me. In many, in many countries, in Africa, in Brazil, there was one organized all, all in South America and Mexico as well, many in Mexico, in America. And then maybe if we start to listen to what fears appear to us and the new dilemmas that also appear to us, we will start to understand more what is the new, the, the, the ethics we're working with. It's, it's very hard to, for me to say, do we have ethics? Come on. Of course, as a person, I presume I have them. But do, re, do I really do? I mean, keep on questioning that. What are the dilemmas? Like people saying, now I'm doing research by telephone. My, I'm doing research, archival research, fantastic. I think it's better to do archive, ethno-historical work than trying to put into words of other people that are not used to, we don't see what they're reacting. And if we don't know them, I know, I know all the people I'm talking with. And I know that the husband is listening to them. I work with women. And I, I know the husband is there and the son is there observing and listening to them. And if they say, so, and I know that they cannot talk to me as freely as, as we, we were in the kitchen and we were outside doing the shopping. So that is also true. We don't know what kind of harm we're doing when we are asking or sharing things that somebody else will be listening to because we don't know what's going around in this when we are using the online. We don't know who is observing or not. So I want to add that. And that fear, fear, as we fear in the, city, in the institutions, the institutions, I, we don't want students to get sick. We don't want students to, et cetera. No? That fear is also in, my, in, my, in myself when I try to contact them because I don't know who is listening to them. And if I say something wrong, that might harm them. So it's more difficult to do online research trying to be ethical, but it is important to learn to do it. I think that is a big opportunity and not only a dilemma, it's something that we have to learn about because it's, as Thomas was saying, we have no idea how long it's going to take. The scientists are saying that this is going to be again in October, November. In Mexico, we'll have a, a, a big crisis maybe in January. In all over the world, I mean, and, and, and we, did, we did harm our environment. We're doing crazy things. Uh, human and human relation has been horrible especially the non-human abuse of them. And now we're surprised that, the, that we have no water. We're surprised that we have no good crops. We're surprised that everything is polluted. We did it ourselves. We, were we ethical anthropologists when we were su suggesting people to put new crops? Because we, we didn't know. We didn't know the harm that the pesticides will do. And we were sometimes helping them to apply it, but we didn't know. So that is also, a lot of ignorance of our part because we are just anthropologists. We are the human side, the, the, the human side of what's going on. So that's, that's something that it's a big opportunity. I agree with uh, Dominguez, no? I think it was Dominguez was placing that issue to us. Thank you. Um, I, I think that, I mean, so, so some of the issues that we talked about are really sort of um, ahistorical. They've been around for a long time. They will continue to be to be around, uh, and I, of course, that makes them very important. Uh, but at the same time, I think, I think there are certain dilemmas, ethical dilemmas, that we are facing right now, and and some of them have been have been alluded to. But I think that we um, we need to pay particular attention to to issues of uh, you know to professional issues of marginality of. Uh, of, uh, of, of young people and, and, you know, precarization of the discipline. I'm not sure I have, you know, any sort of God-given uh, 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 answer to any of it, but I think that they are, um, uh, you know, so, they have so much greater urgency than they did six months ago. Um, uh, I mean, Rosita, you, you might agree, I hear from Australian colleagues how the universities are taking advantage of the, of the pandemic to, you know, shed um, uh, positions. I was hearing from friends at uh, Deakin in Melbourne uh, that, you know, the, VC, the vice chancellor is just going to town uh, 
uh, eliminating uh, positions and uh, making people redundant. I hear the same thing from Britain. And I think that, uh, you know, th this is not field work ethics. This is sort of a, 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 a ethics in a very general way that um, uh, are very much at the forefront of, of in, right in front of us uh, uh, at this point. That's all I want to uh, contribute. So um, uh, thank you so much, Nico. I was wondering whether Thomas wants to say something to as, as kind of a concluding remark since everybody has had a chance to speak three times or so. I can, I just changed locations. I came outside, it was getting a bit stuffy inside. Um, I actually, I, I don't have, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's too enormously complex. The only thing I would add is that um, because of the, we're way behind on online everything. Anthropologists were real ignorant, I think, with respect to the complexities of working online, a lot of the ethical dilemmas that pertain, um, and so on. And um, uh, other folks working in media studies, um, science and technology studies and, and, and some of these other sort of cross-disciplinary fields have, have really thought about a lot of this stuff for a real long time. I know there are anthropologists who've done online work for a while, but um, I would urge, for example, there's a, a group called the Association of um, Online Researchers or Internet and Online Researchers, and I put a link to their ethical discussion on the chat and it's really sophisticated and extremely interesting and there are there are some tricky ethical things that come with online research so if for example the Werner grand foundation is saying they no longer are going to fund ethnographic field work that takes you other places um, <clears throat> you know we might have a, a generation of students who will be imagining largely online mediated field work of various kinds um, I think those folks really need to be put in touch with robust discussions um, and good resources. And they're not going to find them really in anthropology because our, it, it hasn't really been our practice, you know. Um, and so, so I would urge folks to look outside of anthropology for some of that. I mean, obviously, read Tom Belstorff, like Gabriella Coleman, you know, and others. But um, um, I would urge looking at some of these other internet researchers who, who've taken it seriously for a really long time. There's a woman in my university named Kylie Jarrett who does excellent work on search um, and, and so on. So I, that's, that would only be my concluding remark. Um, at the same time, I think we all have to do it irrespective of whether or not field work continues. Because in fact, like, you know, everybody in my field site in Highland, Papua New Guinea has a smartphone. It's paid for by Digicel, a company owned by a name, man named Dennis O'Brien, who happens to be Irish. Um, I happen to be sitting in the country of Ireland. So there are interesting connections all around. So you cannot do field work without mastering the online domain. So um, I think irrespective of what COVID has done, it's time for anthropology to really wake up to the online stuff. Thank you very much and see you next time. Thank you.